One of the realities of our existence and our lives is employment, the workplace. In our country, with rare exception, we have to work for a living. Shouldn't be surprising because when God created Adam, even before sin entered, in the world, sin entered into the world, God gave Adam work to do, tend the garden. The fall didn't introduce the concept of work. The fall just made work harder. And in our society, in our country, our economy is basically based on the principles of capitalism. I realize politicians change and different winds blow through things, but the reality is our economy primarily runs on the buying and selling of goods and services, which of course means that to purchase those goods or services, you have to have money. And the way most of us get money is by selling our labor. Unless you're independently wealthy, you have to work and someone pays you wages. Again, you may eventually have a business, in which case you sell the goods and services, but in that case you employ people. Work is a part of our fabric. And this isn't a message on economics. It doesn't really matter in that sense. It's just the reality of the country that we live in. This is how we operate. And some people love that. They have rewarding jobs. The jobs pay well. They enjoy what they do. They feel like their skills and talents are utilized. And they love going to work on the first day of the week. And for others, even hearing me talk, they're dreading tomorrow because their work isn't that way. Perhaps they aren't compensated well or they don't get to use their skills and abilities or perhaps they just don't like what they're doing. It really doesn't matter because, again, we have to work. I'm sure my upbringing was not different than most of you. Even as a little kid, I was being taught that one day I had to go out into the world and make a living. Work is a major component of our lives. I started working as a teenager. I think my first job that I actually got paid by someone was at 15, and I've been working ever since. Work is, again, a major component of our lives. And despite differences in economic systems, that's the case for most people, but it's definitely the case for us. So it's not surprising that God's word, his handbook for his children for all time, says a lot about work and the workplace. Sometimes the words used have to be explained a little bit for our context, but the reality is the Bible says a lot about how you should work as an employee, and if you are an employer or a boss, it tells you a lot about how you should treat those underneath you. I've been teaching through Colossians in these opportunities I've had to preach. Many times I've been going through Colossians chapter 3, and we come this morning really to the end of the chapter. My scripture reading began back in the middle of the chapter, but the reality is, Paul was writing, and in these verses that we're covering this morning, he tells us really all we need to know about how to do our work, whether we are the employees or whether we're the employers. There are Christians here, excuse me, there are principles here that I think every Christian should take seriously because God means what he says. Even if you're retired, there's still application to you. Even if you're not necessarily working right now, you have influence on others, on your kids, or your grandkids, or people come to you for counsel. And if you're not working yet, one day you will be, and these principles apply to you. So before we dive in, let me give you a brief reminder of the context of this letter. Paul was writing to a church that he had never visited before. It was in a small city called Colossae that in the Roman system really wasn't significant. But there was an active church there that Paul didn't plant, but the person who founded the church knew that the church was in trouble. They were doing well, they were growing, but there was a danger of false teachers that was trying to lead away people. And so the founder of the church, a man named Epaphras, went from Colossae all the way to Rome, a very long trip and a hard trip in those days, to enlist the help of the apostle Paul to protect the church. And the apostle wrote the letter that we call Colossians for that very purpose. Not only reminding them of the truth, but also protecting them from error. But one of the things that's interesting in chapter 3 is he really begins, begins to get into the practical application of everything. How theology is to be lived out. He talks about how we think 
He talks about how we act. A lot of what we read was about the different attitudes we have in our scripture reading this morning, the different attitudes we're supposed to have, how we're supposed to care for one another. We're supposed to be different from the world. The church is supposed to be different. God's children are supposed to be different. Verse 17, I think, is a connector for everything. Colossians 3, 17, whatever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks through him to God the Father. Jesus is to permeate every aspect of our life. The last time I taught from Colossians, we saw how that applies in the family because Paul had instructions for wives and husbands and children and parents. And today, the things that he's talking about really are what would apply in our context to our modern workplaces. So I think we're going to see from this principles for the workplace even today in America. But first I'm going to read it and then we'll begin to dive in. So follow along as I read from Colossians chapter 3 verse 22 down to chapter 4 verse 1. Slaves in all things obey those who are your masters on earth. Not with external service as those who merely please men, but with sincerity of heart fearing the Lord. Whatever you do, do your work heartily. As for the Lord rather than for men, knowing that from the Lord you will receive the reward of the inheritance. It is the Lord Christ whom you serve. For he who does wrong will receive the consequences of the wrong which he has done, and that without partiality. Masters, grant to your slaves justice and fairness, knowing that you too have a master in heaven. Our outline is really fairly simple. It's going to be four points. But it's God's standards for Christians in the workplace. God's standards for Christians in the workplace. And it doesn't matter if you're the employer or the boss, excuse me, the employee or the employer, whether you're the subordinate or the boss, the principles apply to you if you know the Lord Jesus Christ. So the first standard for Christians in the workplace is this. Obedience and submission are non-negotiable. Obedience and submission are non-negotiable. Verse 22 says this, Slaves in all things obey those who are your masters on earth, not with external service as those who merely please men, but with sincerity of heart, fearing the Lord. Now, because of our context in America, we need to make sure we understand the terms, and I hope to be able to convince you that this does apply to us, but the first word causes trouble for America, because we read slaves. And slavery to us as Americans means something. And so we need to understand the context of how this word was originally used in the Roman system, in the Roman Empire, so that we don't get our American views and confuse ourselves to think this doesn't have any application to us. I mean, after all, the American Constitution prohibits slavery. But I'm going to suggest to you that the words still apply, even though the context is a little different. Slavery in America was brutal and awful and treated people created in the image of God as subhuman. It's a stain on the legacy of our great country. It can't be sugar-coated or explained away. It was horrible. And I'm not suggesting to you that the slavery of the Roman Empire was wonderful. I'm just trying to suggest to you that it was different. Slaves in the Roman Empire occupied a different status. They had different rules. Yes, they were owned, but their slavery allowed them to earn wages. Things were a little bit different, unlike America. In fact, they could even get their freedom, and then they would just become regular citizens. I did some reading this week on the role and the nature of a slave in the Roman economy. And I came across a paper by an economist from MIT who wrote extensively. He had some things that I think will help us understand this. Particularly the contrast between slavery in the Roman Empire and slavery in America. I quote, Anthropologists distinguish between open slavery in which slaves can be freed and accepted fully into general society and closed slavery in which slaves are a separate group not accepted into general society and not allowed to marry among the general population when freed. Roman slavery conformed to the open model again in sharp contrast to American slavery. Freedmen were granted Roman citizenship. Their children could be town counselors and their grandchildren could be knights. Freed slaves retained the names and 
of and connections with their former owners and could be identified as members of their owner's family, providing former slaves with a reputation that helped them to operate in the economy. A productive freedman also increased the reputation and income of his former owner and his family. Freedmen could marry other Roman citizens, and marriages of widows with freedmen were common. Children and grandchildren of freedmen were accepted fully into Roman society. Even a cursory understanding of American history shows how different things were here, but in the Roman system, slaves were more of a product of the economy than any ethnic thing. They came from the pool of nations that were conquered. In fact, I read some poor individuals in the Roman system would sell themselves into slavery because there would be certain advantages. I share this not to commend or anything else. It's just to point out that when we see slaves in the New Testament, we have to be careful to immediately equate it with what existed in America and think, well, this doesn't apply to us. In fact, I would suggest to you, based on the research that's there, that in many contexts, slaves were more like employees earning wages than like the slavery that existed in America. They were owned, don't get me wrong, I'm not suggesting it was a fantasy or a good thing, but it was a part of the economic system and the labor market. Again, from the same MIT economist. But in the early Roman Empire, particularly in cities, slaves were able to participate in the labor market in almost the same way as free laborers, even if their starting point often was less favorable. Frequent manumission, that is, freeing of slaves, was a distinguishing feature of Roman slavery. Slaves in the early Roman Empire could anticipate freedom if they worked hard and demonstrated skill or accumulated a peculium money owned by slaves which, with which to purchase freedom. Even though slaves technically could not own property, the peculium was protected by law from the slave's owner, and a freed slave kept his peculium. The promise of manumission was most apparent for urban literate slaves, but it pervaded Roman society. In other words, save, slavery was a part of the economic system. Slaves could work. Certainly they were directed by their master, but they could earn income and then they could use it to purchase their freedom. There were menial slaves doing household tasks, but also there were doctors and professionals like teachers who were slaves. It was a function of the economic system. So while systems have changed and the Roman Empire is no more, the Roman Empire had such a profound impact on Western civilization that the principles actually carry through to today. Every commentator that I read on this passage makes it clear the closest analogy to a slave in the Roman system is an employee in the American system of capitalism. In fact, the Roman system had such an impact that over the centuries, even after the Roman system was long done, their legal system imprinted future legal systems, including that in America, such that if you study labor law, and I was a, an employment attorney, I did labor law, a lot of the treatises on the law will use the term master and servant, talking about employer and employee. In fact, I read an article this week that in the state of Washington, um, sometime earlier this year, they were trying to pass a law to get rid of those terms because their labor law still used the terms master and servant, and they attributed it to the American system of slavery, which they were off by a few millennia, but the principle was they wanted to change it. My idea to you, though, is that the backdrop and the context is to see that in our text, it does have application to us. In fact, I think the direct application is as an employee and as an employer. So with that in mind, as we go through the text, if you're an employee that works for a company, the principles applied to slaves are the principles that apply to you. And if you're an employer or a boss or a supervisor, you may be an employee, but you also may be an employer or a master in the context of this. So, hopefully having convinced you that this has applicability to us, and this isn't just archaic instruction to people that ceased to exist long ago, let's look back at the first point in our text. Obedience and submission are non-negotiable. Slaves, in all things, obey those who are your masters on earth, not with external service as those who merely please men, but with sincerity of heart, fearing the Lord. 
one of the things the early church did was it changed the status of the individuals that comprised the church. The church consisted of people who included slaves and masters. It broke down all social barriers. And the Bible doesn't try and deal with whether slavery is good, bad, or otherwise. It just accepts it as this is the reality in which we exist. That was the economic system that confronted the writers of the New Testament. When a slave came to Christ, he was supposed to live differently as a slave. 1 Corinthians 7, 21 to 24 acknowledges that some in the church were slaves, some in the church were free. Were you called while a slave? Do not worry about it. But if you're able also to become free, rather do that. For he who was called in the Lord while a slave is the Lord's freedman. Likewise, he who was called while free is Christ's slave. You were bought with a price. Do not become slaves of men. Brethren, each one is to remain with God in that condition in which he was called. The point being that whatever state you're in, you can serve the Lord. You can be a valid member of the body of Christ. Being a slave did not give you second class status in the church. One verse before where I started our scripture reading this morning in Colossians chapter 3 verse 11, the apostle Paul makes that point. A renewal in which there is no distinction between Greek and Jew, circumcised and uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave and freeman, but Christ is all and in all. So Paul wasn't trying to bring about a revolution. He was just trying to tell you, how do you exist in the system in which you find yourself? And in that context, I believe his words apply today to our employment system. And where he says, slaves and all things obey those who are your masters on earth. He's talking to employees, employees obey those who are your bosses on earth. It's a comprehensive statement. Now, in any place in the Bible where we're told to submit or obey, there's always one qualification. It's a qualification for wives submitting to husbands, us submitting to our government. It's this, Acts 5.29. But Peter and the apostles answered, we must obey God rather than men. So, of course, if your employer asks you to do something illegal, you don't do it. If your employer asks you to lie or to be unethical, you wouldn't do it. That would be sin against God. But absent something like that, We're told in all things obey. It's comprehensive. It's everything related to your employment. In fact, he even uses the words, your masters on earth to make it clear you're not the authority in your workplace. You're accountable to someone else. It's always something in the back of our minds that thinks, well, but that probably only applies if I've got a good boss or a good employer. But in a Similar text addressing the exact same issue, Peter made it clear that it doesn't matter how your boss or employer acts. 1 Peter 2.18, servants, be submissive to your masters with all respect, not only to those who are good and gentle, but also to those who are unreasonable. And the word unreasonable actually means something more than just incompetent or not nice. It means evil and wicked. So the sum total of scripture makes it clear if you're an employee in our system if you want to serve the Lord you have to obey and submit to your employer. You have to be willing to work obediently and respectfully under the authority of your employer and it's not just outward behavior. It's an issue of your heart and your attitude. Paul says, not with external service at those who merely please men, but with sincerity of heart, fearing the Lord. In other words, Paul understands human nature. When the boss is watching, we jump to it. You've probably worked with people like that. They were superstar employees if the boss is looking. But as soon as somebody's not watching, they're lazy and they do whatever they want. That can't be the case with a Christian employee, not with external service, just going through the motions as those who merely please men, in other words, trying to show off for something. Somebody who's a hypocrite in the workplace, it's like the religious hypocrisy 
of people that just wanted to be seen by men. For example, Matthew 6, 2. So when you give to the poor, do not sound a trumpet before you as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and in the streets so that they may be honored by men. Truly I say to you, they have their reward in full. The point for us in the workplace isn't just to fool people or to get a pat on the back. Disrespectful work that's just going through the motions, that's just trying to impress someone, doesn't impress the Lord. Paul says we're supposed to work, we're supposed to obey in all things with sincerity of heart, fearing the Lord. In other words, we operate understanding that God is always watching us, even when we go to work. That's the standard for every believer. You should have pride in your work, not because you want to look good or because you want a bigger paycheck, but because you're an ambassador of Jesus Christ and how you do your job is part of your testimony. You may not care about your employer or their product of service. Not all jobs are thrilling and exciting, but it doesn't matter. With sincerity of heart, you obey knowing that you're accountable to God for how you do your job. You were to work with reverent fear, knowing the principles of Galatians 6, 7. Do not be deceived. God is not mocked. For whatever a man sows, this he will also reap. When you enter the workplace, you're entering as a representative of Jesus Christ, and you can't ever forget that. Paul gave very similar instruction. In fact, there's a parallel passage in Ephesians 6 that deals with all the same principles we're covering this morning. But in Ephesians 6, verses 5 and 6, Paul says this, Slaves, be obedient to those who are your masters according to the flesh with fear and trembling in the sincerity of your heart as to Christ, not by way of eye service as men pleasers, but as slaves of Christ, doing the will of God from the heart. As hard as it is to believe Your work is an act of worship to the God you serve. You ought to be the most obedient, rule-following employee that your employer has ever seen. It's for your testimony in Christ. And if by chance someone asks, why do you go the extra mile? Why do you do what you do? You can tell them it's because of Jesus. Jesus. And that really leads us to the second point. Obedience and submission are non-negotiable. But God's standards for Christians in the workplace also include a second point. Working hard is a God-given mandate. Working hard is a God-given mandate. Verse 23 says this. Whatever you do, do your work heartily as for the Lord rather than for men. This is very direct. Paul understands that in the economic system, slaves have many different tasks to do. As I said, some doctors, some teachers, some professional class, but there were also people doing menial labor. Paul's saying, whatever your job is, whatever it is, it doesn't matter. Do your work heartily. The word heartily comes from a word that's really translated from the soul, meaning with all your effort, with all your energy, with all your might. Even an unpleasant assignment, even in unpleasant assignments, it's an attitude that says, I'm going to do my very best. Regardless of what you've been called to do, do it with effort and energy. Just say it. There's no place for laziness in the life of a Christian when it comes to work. It doesn't honor the Lord. You can't just go through the motions. You don't get just to mail it in. You're not just earning a paycheck so you can get to do other things. While you're there, you need to work from your heart with everything. Now, again, I'm not saying become a workaholic. The Bible is all about balance. If you work to the neglect of your family, you've overdone it. But the point is, while you're at work, work. When I was a young believer... I was already started in my career when I came to faith. I was always looking for scriptures, and I would write them down on a three-by-five card. There were no smartphones. I would write them down, so I'd look at them through the day. And I was particularly drawn to several proverbs that had to do with laziness versus hard work. 
One still sticks with me to this day. Proverbs 6, 6 to 11. Go to the ant, O sluggard, observe her ways and be wise, which, having no chief, officer, or ruler, prepares her food in the summer and gathers her provision in the harvest. How long will you lie down, O sluggard? When will you arise from your sleep? A little sleep, a little slumber, a little folding of the hands to rest? Your poverty will come in like a vagabond and your need like an armed man. In other words, that ant is so diligent, doesn't need anybody watching, the ant's doing the work. The sluggard will go hungry because they just won't work. Proverbs 15, 19. The way of the lazy is as a hedge of thorns, but the path of the upright is a highway. I want to stress with all my heart, take this seriously. I don't know what job you have right now. I've had a lot of jobs over the years that weren't thrilling or exciting. Not everything we do here is thrilling and exciting. It doesn't matter. You've got to use your best effort and energy. You've got to work your hardest all the time. Be the best. Be the most hardworking employee that your employer has. Now, of course, there are times where if you do hard work, it may be recognized. Proverbs twenty two twenty nine says, Do you see a man skilled in his work? He will stand before kings. He will not stand before obscure men. Just a general principle that sometimes your hard work will get you rewarded and you'll move up the ladder. Proverbs twenty seven eighteen: He who tends the fig tree will eat its fruit, and he who cares for his master will be honored. So there are times when working hard has dividends. But that can't be your sole motivation. Whatever you do, do your work heartily. Ask for the Lord rather than for men, meaning you're not pursuing the rewards. Those may come. You're pursuing the Lord. You're doing it for Him. You've got to check your heart, even if you're good, that you're not doing what you're doing because you enjoy the pats on the backs and the nice evaluations. Your motivation needs to be that God is watching and He cares. When you see a pattern here, God is the focus over and over. The end of verse 22, but with sincerity of heart, fearing the Lord, God's watching you work. Verse 23, as for the Lord rather than for men, God's watching you work. And that really leads to what I have as our third point. The third standard for Christians in the workplace. Obedience and submission are non-negotiable. Working hard is a God-given mandate. Third, God is your ultimate employer. God is your ultimate employer. Verse 24 makes this clear. Knowing that from the Lord you will receive the reward of the inheritance, it is the Lord Christ whom you serve. He really gives us all the motivation we need to go to our workplace, possibly if your work week starts tomorrow, and do a better job than you've ever done. I would encourage you to pray, Lord, help me understand that when I go into this workplace, whatever it is I'm doing, I'm serving you. Your work is an act of worship. Now, verse 24, he starts out by saying, knowing that the Lord, that from the Lord you will receive the reward of the inheritance. In other words, I think he's acknowledging that sometimes you may not get everything that you're entitled to, but don't worry. Since you work for the Lord, he's got you covered. It would have been particularly encouraging for a slave because slaves weren't allowed to inherit property. So it's a reminder to them that, look, you have something greater than that. The the New Testament often talks about our salvation in terms of an inheritance we have in heaven. And I think Paul's borrowing that language to remind the slaves of what they have and what they can look forward to. For example, in 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 3 and 4, Peter says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his great mercy has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead to obtain an inheritance which is imperishable and undefiled and will not fade away reserved in heaven for you. It's almost as, that, as though Paul is reminding these servants, he's reminding us as employees that one day, God's going to take care of everything. You're going to get all that you deserve. You're going to get all that you need. God's going to reward you for your obedient service in the workplace. 
may not come now, but it's a part of our inheritances in Christ. He's reminding his hearers that there are rewards one day with God for our obedience to his commands. There's a sense in which sometimes it's challenging to think about this because in the ultimate sense, we don't get what we deserve. Why do I say that? Because the wages of sin is death and we're all sinners. But because of the free gift of God and salvation in Jesus Christ, we get God's mercy. Jesus died. He was the just. He died for the unjust. But having been the recipients of that transaction, the eternal work of God in our lives, the New Testament makes clear that there will be a time where we stand before the Lord not to account for our sins. Christ paid for those. They were nailed to the cross. They aren't held against us. But the works that we did as Christians, God will evaluate them for the good works. We will get rewards. For example, in 1 Corinthians 3, 12 to 15, I think this is what Paul is talking about. Now, if any man builds on the foundation with gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, straw, each man's work will become evident. For the day will show up because it is to be revealed with fire. And the fire itself will test the quality of each man's work. If any man's work which he has built on it remains, he will receive a reward. If any man's work is burned up, he will suffer loss, but he himself will be saved Yet so is through fire. Again, in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 9 and 10, Paul says this, Therefore, we also have as our ambition, whether at home or absent, to be pleasing to him. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, so that each one may be recompensed for his deeds in the body according to what he has done, whether good or bad. Now again, don't misunderstand. None of this is earning our salvation. Ephesians 2, 8, and 9. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and not of yourselves. It is a gift of God, not as a result of works, so that no one may boast. But once we are saved, we've been given that gift. God is watching, and the good things that we do will be rewarded one day in heaven. That's what I think Paul is talking about in this instruction to slaves, which is instruction to employees. You know that one day the Lord will give you your inheritance, including the rewards for being a faithful and good and honest, dependable employee. And Paul makes clear again what he's already been repeating in different words. It is the Lord Christ whom you serve. Very easy to lose sight of this in America. I just recently did my taxes. Like you, I get a W-2, like most of you. The W-2 has our employer name and our taxpayer ID number, and it's very easy to start thinking in an American transactional sense that that's my employer. I think the reminder to us from Paul is that that's just a W-2. Your real employer, employer is the Lord Jesus Christ. He's watching, you're serving him, even with your task, no matter what it is. It's the Lord Christ whom you serve. And that just, just, that's not just those who have jobs with Christian organizations at a Christian school or a Christian ministry or at a church. It applies to every employment everywhere. Again, it's a matter of your testimony that you remember this and that you take that attitude into the workplace that you're serving the Lord. God cares, you should care. 1 Timothy 6.1 All who are under the yoke of slaves are to regard their own masters as worthy of all honor so that the name of God and our doctrine will not be spoken against. There's enough bad things that people say about Christianity. Don't let any of it be because you work for them and you're a bad testimony. Sadly, too many of us forget who we actually serve. And it's interesting because Paul almost anticipates that somebody might disregard his instruction. And he gives a warning in verse 25. For he who does wrong will receive the consequences of the wrong which he has done, and that without partiality. In other words, while you're laboring here on earth, if you don't do your job the right way, you'll pay the consequences. And the fact that you're a Christian won't excuse you from those consequences. In my old career, as I mentioned, I was a labor lawyer I represented management, so a good chunk of what I did was dealing with the discipline of employees. For years, nobody was happy to see me 
it was very discouraging at some times. I wasn't the angel of death, but I always brought bad news to whoever I was talking to. But where I would always cringe is when I would see people that I knew claim to be Christians in the crosshairs. Sometimes it was legitimate discipline and they tried to justify that I'm being persecuted and it's like, you're not being persecuted, you're just a bad employee. There's a difference. Reading your Bible at lunch is fine. Reading your Bible when you're supposed to be working is a bad testimony. Sadly, I think many get lost in that process and forget that they're accountable to the Lord for doing a hard day's obedient work every day. R. Kent Hughes in his commentary on Colossians has a great story that he tells and it bore out with some of my own experiences over the years. But he says this, I once had an employer tell me that he had become skeptical skeptical about Christian employees because of his experience with two theological students who always who seemed to be always standing around talking about God during work hours. But what really did it was when the boss observed one go into the bathroom for 20 minutes, when the employee emerged, he told his fellow student, I just had the most wonderful time. I read three chapters of John in the John. (laughs) Now, in one sense, that's a funny story. In another sense, it's shameful. When they were supposed to be working, these students were standing around talking And there's nothing wrong with thinking and praying and doing those things. But when you're at work, you have to work. And to abuse even something like a break and justify it is wrong. We should be the standard for all other employees. No matter what we do, no matter where we work, we serve the Lord Jesus Christ. And if we don't, we should expect to pay the consequences. I think Peter would echo Paul's warning in a similar context in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 20, where he's talking about the same issues of slaves and masters. He says this, For what credit is there if, when you sin and are harshly treated, you endure it with patience? He's talking about the work environment. He's saying you don't get credit when you get what you deserve for being a bad employee. And if you're a lazy or bad employee, when you stand before the Lord, that's not the kind of behavior that he passes out rewards for. That brings us to our final point. Up to now, Paul has been talking to slaves, employees, those of us who work for somebody else, but now he turns his attention to the other half of the workplace equations, those who are the employers, the masters. Be this a supervisor or an owner or a manager. That's the final standards for Christians in the workplace. Obedience and submission are non-negotiable. Working hard is a God-given mandate. God is your ultimate employer for treat your employees well in all things. Treat your employees well in all things. Chapter 4, verse 1. Masters, grant to your slaves justice and fairness, knowing that you too have a master in heaven. More than one commentator pointed out that these types of words in the New Testament era were revolutionary. Masters had a certain place in the economic system, and there were no responsibilities on the part of the master towards the slave, but Paul is saying that if you're a believing master, you have responsibilities before the Lord. Again, I already noted from Colossians 3.11 that slaves and free were equal in the church. That's still the case. Galatians 3.28 makes the same point. There's neither Jew nor Greek. There's neither slave nor free man. There's neither male or female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. So in the church, the masters and the slave, it didn't matter. But in the workplace, Paul's reminding the masters that, yes, the slaves have duties. The employees have duties. They have responsibilities. But you have responsibilities as well, employer. Grant to your slaves justice and fairness. In other words, treat them well. Deal with them fairly. You're not arbitrary and capricious. But you yourself follow the rules and treat an employee equally treating them kindly, treating them appropriately. Again, in that parallel passage in Ephesians 6, 
the Apostle Paul says to the masters something similar. Verse 7, with good will, render service as to the Lord and not to men, knowing that whatever good thing each one does, this he will receive back from the Lord, whether slave or free. And masters do the same things to them and give up threatening. In other words, there, were, there are reciprocal duties. If you're the employer, if you're the supervisor, the boss, you need to take seriously your responsibility to treat those beneath you with justice and fairness and kindness. That little phrase, give up threatening, is described in many American workplaces where you rule through intimidation and fear. That's not appropriate for a believer. If you're a Christian employer, a Christian manager, you should be fair. You should not play favorites. You should treat your employees kindly and gently. There's no place for yelling and screaming at employees. That does not becoming of a believer. Anger and intimidation shouldn't be your governance style. In no way am I suggesting employees shouldn't be held accountable. But when you hold them accountable, you do it in a Christ-like manner. Even if you have to correct them, admonish, admonish them, or even if you have to fire them, you do it with kindness and gentleness. You do it in a way that honors the Lord, doesn't bring reproach upon him. I believe that the duties that all Christians have in Ephesians chapter 4, verses 29 to 32, would apply certainly to a Christian manager, employer, boss. Ephesians 4, 29, let no unwholesome word proceed from your mouth, but only such a word as is good for edification according to the need of the moment, so that it will give grace to those who hear. Do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and slander be put away from you, along with all malice. Be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving each other, just as God in Christ Jesus also has forgiven you. If you're an employer, if you're a supervisor, if you're the boss, if you're the master, you need to take seriously words like that. That's what granting justice and fairness looks like. It's being like Christ. I've seen and I've heard of Christian employers who should know better berating and belittling and abusing employees, demeaning them and humiliating them as though it's just okay because it's the workplace. That is sin. It dishonors the Lord. And it brings to mind Paul's reminder of the accountability. Masters grant your slaves justice and fairness knowing that you too have a master in heaven. God is watching employees, but God is also watching the employers, the masters. We're not allowed to dishonor him by unfair and abusive treatment of employees, even if it's accepted in the American system. Think about how your heavenly father, your master in heaven, treats you. And don't be afraid to show the same love and mercy and grace to your employees. Again, you can hold them accountable, but do it in a Christ-like way. And even if your employees disobey or let you down or do something bad to you, you can't retaliate. 1 Peter 3, 8 and 9, to sum up, all of you be harmonious, sympathetic, brotherly, kind-hearted, and humble in spirit, not returning evil for evil or insult for insult, but giving a blessing instead, for you were called for the very purpose that you might inherit a blessing. Those are general principles to all believers, but certainly they would apply in the workplace if you're the master in that situation. The idea is not original to me, but multiple commentators said, in your leadership style, model the golden rule. Matthew 7, 12. In everything, therefore, treat people the same way you want them to treat you, for this is the law and the prophets. Again, I think the words of R. Kent Hughes are helpful. Employers, if you truly realize that you must answer to God for the way you conduct yourselves with your employees, you will care about what happens to them. You will be concerned that they are paid properly. You will be concerned about their illnesses, their spouses, their children, their education. Along with this, you may have more problems. In fact, this kind of caring attitude assures that you will, but you will also have the fullness of Christ. Christ. 
If you're the master over others as an employer, as a supervisor, as a boss, remember that you're representing your master in heaven every day in the workplace. Show your employees his character and kindness, not your sinful temper and frustration. Brothers and sisters, there should not be a difference in your character when you're here on Sunday and when you go to work. God's not any different here than there. He is our master, he's the Lord, and he's watching us in everything. Right now, as you hear my voice and you're here worshiping, you're serving the Lord Jesus Christ, but you're doing the same thing tomorrow when you clock in. Whether you're an employee or an employer, do your work. Carry out your responsibilities as unto him. Reading again, Colossians three seventeen, it sums it all up. Whatever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks through him to God the Father. Please join me in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for your clear instruction. Lord, where we failed as employees, where we failed as employers, bring it to our minds so that we can ask for forgiveness from you. And Lord, so that we can repent and change. I pray that we wouldn't have just heard these words today, but every one of us, including me, will take it seriously when we go into the workplace this week. Lord, help us to remember that we serve you in everything, including in the workplace. Lord, I also am certain, as is always the case when we gather, that some that are hearing my voice don't know Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. Lord, perhaps they're going through the motions of Christianity, whatever the case. Lord, I pray that today you would convict them and they would understand that before a holy God, they are accountable for their sin. The wages of sin is death. But Lord, I also pray that you would help them to see that Jesus died in the place of sinners. The penalty that is theirs Jesus took if they only believe. Lord, their biggest problem is not the workplace. Their biggest problem is that they're going to stand before you one day. I pray that they would believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and be saved. And for all of us, Lord, particularly those of us who know you as Lord and Savior, help us take seriously these words. I've said it multiple times, Lord, but I pray it for everyone here, including myself. Lord, help us to be doers of your word and not merely hearers who delude ourselves. Lord, we love you. We ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you.